for joining us here today. Yeah, we are going to record this event as you already heard. And uh, thank you everyone for coming here today and for this uh, masterclass about post-digital activism and engagement in online communities. And um, I'm very happy to see that many people here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like really wonderful that we have so many people here, because if three years ago you would ask me whether I believe it is possible to organize international events, networking conferences online, I would definitely say no. Uh, because I thought that there were too many obstacles, too many issues to overcome to achieve this high level of engagement and activity online. However, here we are today after more than two years of many online activities and gathered in this masterclass to talk about digital social activism and how to campaign using digital instruments, how to create networks of solidarity between different groups of people online. And as you know, COVID-19 in many ways transformed the way how we perceive the world and how we use the means of communication. And this crisis highlighted many social problems that existed in the society even before, but became more prominent during these times. And some of these issues like access to housing, gender inequality, access to social security, they became even more urgent and they demand urgent political action and also urgent action on the level of social and grassroots activism. And today we are going to discuss how to campaign online how to organize this social activist campaigns using the means of digital communication and how this transition between online and offline happens. And I hope together we could not only, um, not only answer these questions, but also to discuss our own experiences about social activism, successful and sometimes unsuccessful mobilizations. And our guests today are going to be the great speakers and Lesa Donet from an urban initiative, Save Quito Ukraine. And this initiative is aiming to save the building Quito Ukraine, this modernist building. And uh, the initiative emerged on July 2021 as a response to the, to the attempt of the building's owner to demolish it. And today we have also Marta Lambert, initiative of a feminist social movement, Ogolopolsky Strike Kobiet. Uh, the movement was established in September 2016 in the protest against the rejection of a bill Save Women by the Polish Parliament. And also we have here Daniel Gutierrez from the social housing initiative Deutsche Wohen und Co. and Tignen. The initiative's aim is to expropriate over two, 240,000 apartments from major real estate investment companies. And I'm very happy to have all the speakers here. But before we jump into the, our presentations and our masterclass, I would also would like to give a floor to the um, uh, organizers of this masterclass, of this project, and uh, Stefan Henkel and uh, uh, Alena Sirbu. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Um, yeah, hello uh, everyone. It's um, very, I'm very happy to to um, see that uh, there are so many of you today. And um, yeah, before we start, I will just um, say a few words maybe about the project and the um, the, the for the, the event itself. Um, the actually it's organized as a part of. Um, a series of public events in the frame of a project Ukraine Calling, which is implemented by uh, Viadrina University and uh, also a CETUS think tank uh, as a partner of, of this project. And um, this series of uh, public events um, is going to explore the um, different um, different factors which uh, uh, which have impact of, on local development. Actually, we already had a uh, uh, um, public event, public discussion about regional development. Then we had a networking event also connected to the issues of local development. And today we uh, talk about uh, all these uh, uh, means of um, online communities and digital communication and also um, transformation of activism into uh, digital and also post-digital. Uh, and also we uh, we try to raise the issues, how it uh, influences the uh, local development and uh, local communities and their um, ability to 
uh, organize and uh, uh, bring together. Um, and um, I, I'm very uh, looking forward to today's event and um, thank you for coming. Um, then I will pass the word to Stefan. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, it's re a real great pleasure to, to see you all. Uh, and I mean, uh, the participants of Ukraine Calling uh, who are coming in here now directly at the European University of Adrina after a scheduled COVID test, we have to follow the rules of the house under these um, um, pandemic uh, conditions. Um, and therefore, it might be also a good format actually for um, uh, that it needs to post digital to have some parts of a project uh, in the online space and some other parts uh, in the offline space. I might, might uh, share this uh, uh, short impression here. Um, and uh, that, that is also, of course, uh, part of the topic of today. Um, and I'm really looking forward um, to, uh, to get to know more about the intertwine, intertwinement of the uh, uh, digital and the non-digital, uh, because modern without the other seems to be uh, worth nothing nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe two words about the project you can call in itself. It's a capacity building uh, for um, uh, civil society organizations, uh, um, a transnational one uh, that have a certain project idea they want to implement uh, um, in the aftermath of the project itself. Um, and we are uh, giving all the impulses, uh, be it academic, uh, be it uh, skill, uh, skills as fundraising or and networking um, to uh, make the realization of the mainly uh, um, social projects and educational projects in the end possible. So uh, I cannot imagine a, a better uh, a panel uh, than today, actually. Um, it's a great honor to have you all um, here. And uh, I would give back the word to Astia. Thank you, Stefan. I'm a little bit envious of the participants there at the Adriana University because they could uh, see each other and communicate each other, with each other. But also, I think that we will try to get the most out of, of the online format as well. And before we are going to jump into our great presentations and discussion, I will also walk you through the timeline of this event. Mm. And uh, just a second. Um, if, um, I hope that you can see with my screen well. Um, in a few moments, you will be able to do it. And um, so uh, uh, our event will consist of a few parts. First part is introduction. We already more or less uh, covered this part. After that, we will have the presentations and Q&A approximately uh, uh, from 10.15 to 11.30. And uh, we will have three presentations from our speakers. After each of the presentations, we will have a few minutes for Q&A. And uh, I think that uh, it's great if you write your questions in chat, but also if you feel like talking, just raise the hands and speak up. After all of the presentations, we will also have uh, some more time for bigger discussion. And I would strongly encourage you not only to ask questions, but also share your own experiences about social activism and campaigning. So as I've said, or write, either write your questions into the chat or raise a hand and speak up. After the presentations and Q&A, we will have a small break, um, approximately 15 minutes. And uh, uh, during this break, we will assign you to three separate groups for group work. We will explain how it works later. Uh, but um, after the break, we will have the second part of our event, which is going to be a group work. You will be assigned to three separate groups with each and in each of the group, you will going to have the time to communicate with one of our speakers. And this is the time for sharing your own experience of social campaigning as well, asking questions and receiving feedback uh, from our speakers and uh, just to uh, sort of communicating and sharing experiences and networking. And uh, finally, after the group work, we will have a few minutes for reflections and final remarks in this bigger circle. And we will ask 
each, well, not each, but one of the participants from each of the groups to share their own insights and findings from this wonderful event. So that's more or less it. And uh, I would like you also to introduce yourself, participants. Please uh, now using it in the chat, write your name and maybe organization, and maybe share a little bit of your experience in social campaigns with us in chat so we could uh, sort of recreate the atmosphere of an on, of offline event and to, to communicate with everyone. So please uh, introduce yourself. And while you do that, I will stop uh, sharing the screen. And um, we, will, could, we could jump in into our presentations. And I would like to give a floor to Lesa Donets from Initiative Kvito Ukraine. Lesa, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, that was fast. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Lesa Donets. Uh, I'm from Kyiv, Ukraine. Um, I'm a fresh activist, actually speaking. This year is when, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this year is when I started uh, the campaigning because of uh, the Kvitu Ukraine building. Uh, I will now start sharing my uh, screen also. So yeah, um, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you uh, about Kvito Ukraine itself, uh, how our campaigning was going, what this is, what the context is, and what are the lessons that I've learned. I hope that they help. Uh, they help inspire you to go on with your goals, and I also hope that some of your experience will help us uh, get new ideas of how to pursue our goals. So uh, this is Kvite Ukraine. Uh, it's a modernist building uh, built in Kiev, Ukraine in 1980s. Uh, it was kind of experimental, really elegant, uh, fitted into the street and uh, great looking. It was uh, considered like a Methodist and educational pavilion, but like in fact, it was a greenhouse and a flower shop. Uh, they had experimental floristics inside it. Uh, people all over the neighborhood and Kiev, like our case is quite local, uh, they adored it because, uh, like because of this romantic uh, way it was built, and also uh, because of the interiors. And oh, I'm sorry, because of the interiors and because of the green wall that it had for quite a long time. It was like a grape cover in it for 25 years at least. Uh, this is actually how the house, uh, like how the building looked like four months Lisa, ago. Lisa, I'm sorry, but I think that the presentation is not moving. We still see the first slide. Hmm. Okay, let me maybe, let me try to, now, now it works. Now we see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is this is how the building looked like in the eighties. Uh, this is what it was like in the inside, outside, and this is actually how it looks right now. And still, uh, we, 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 yeah. Sorry, Lisa, but the, the the pictures are not changing. So um... yeah, we will have to. Okay, what do we do? What do we do? Is it, uh, is it possible to do it manually? You mean like... We can we can the exact pictures that you would like to share with us because... <laughs> okay, what if I... Uh, just a second. What if I do you see it now? Mm, yeah, now we see uh, now we see the building how it looks like right now. Uh, now we see the historical pictures. Yeah. Now ah, it works. Okay, we found a way. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Well, anyway, this is how the building looks right now. It's partly demolished. Um, Back in the 90s, um, it became private property. Uh, it changed its function, like it, it had nothing to do with the flowers. Uh, it became like an office center, a supermarket. 
And he decided that he wanted to have an office center that looks really differently from what all the neighbors loved. Um, I will now show you what the plan was. And this is, was super disturbing for, uh, for the neighborhood uh, and for like a wider audience in Kiev. Uh, Uh, historical like business center if we needed this type of building on the street and actually everybody just acted as if uh, people living in Kiev didn't really have the right to choose what we want uh, on our streets uh, which was, which is kind of a typical situation in Ukraine for like last 30 years, but right now the mindset started shifting and uh, people want to have more rights and more control of their lives, including what they have and what they see on the streets. Um, now, like, get this picture. I'll show you a bit of uh, wider context, like why this question hurt <laughs> uh, a lot of people. Uh, we actually have quite a long story of, um, of demolishing historical uh, and valuable buildings. I'm sorry, my cat is terrorizing me. Uh, and valuable buildings, uh, like for 20 or something years uh, after the Soviet Union broke, nobody really cared because people had to deal with a lot of more problems like rebuilding their lives in a new system. Uh, but then people started fighting for something that was precious to them. This is one of examples that like had a huge media coverage. And actually it just stands like that for um, at least 10 years. Uh, nothing that the activists would do never helped renovate it or revitalize it. And the problem is still open. Uh, we have uh, like this year, uh, almost every week we have a news of uh, some historical building, I mean like 100 years uh, or more, uh, or modernist building that becomes endangered by, um, I don't know, by, by some new developers who just want to build something new on it. Uh, this is actually like a, one of examples of the houses, which was perfectly great, but it was just demolished in the middle of pandemic uh, during the lockdown when nobody could actually stand up for it. And uh, these are the cases of modernist buildings, uh, which are not being taken care of properly. Uh, three of them are actually under the danger of the construction right now. And uh, this one is one of the most famous uh, buildings uh, of modernist era in uh, Kyiv, uh, which was supposed to look like, and it actually looked like that for more than 50 years, uh, like a UFO landing or like levitating over the building, which is kind of a famous thing. Everybody knows it, everybody loves it. But last year we were fighting for it not to become a part of a shopping mall. And uh, I cannot really say that we succeeded. So this is what's going on around us, like all the time. Uh, you always hear it in media that you have like some new building that you love under, under this danger. And this is uh, why uh, when we heard that Kvitu Ukraine uh, could also be uh, turned into like a glass business center, it touched us a lot. Also about uh, the context, what you see right now uh, is a great example of how bureaucracy works in Ukraine. Uh, this is actually a building uh, in the middle of one of the historical districts. It had to be kind of lower. You can actually see the, the, the roof. And uh, the owner just built like four floors on it, on top of it. Uh, the neighborhood, the community, uh, the activists, they fought for it quite hard and they actually have all the documents uh, saying that this house needs to be lowered down. But then 
for the last four years, they've just had courts and cassations and so on. So uh, when you start protecting a building uh, or uh, like doing this activist thing, you just have to understand that this is quite a long process that just could uh, go into courts and last forever. Um, so this is what we actually knew when we started when we started going into the Kvitu Ukraina case. Uh, now uh, I will try to tell you a bit more about how it's all going on and why it was why why it is a kind of success story in our case. Uh, first of all, what I learned during the Kvitu Ukraini is that, uh, well, you always have to know your audience. You have to know who you're working with, uh, who you're trying to explain your messages to. You, uh, you better try to collect all this community as soon as you can and look at them closely so that you know what media they read, what people they listen to, what makes them move. Uh, you can actually ask questions to those people and that would help you a lot uh, when planning any kind of your activities. In our case, uh, we had a neighborhood chat, uh, like we were one step further from the very beginning because we actually, as an as initiative, we were born from this neighborhood chat. So when we had a lot of not really interesting stuff going on about Kvito Ukraine, like writing applications to the police, uh, going to course, something like that. We already had this neighborhood community. Um, and that was a great start. Uh, at that moment, we could already start thinking what makes these people help us? Like, is it for, I don't know, aesthetical reasons? Is this the historical value? Is this some urban thinking of how this place is planned and how they can use the community space around it? Like, what makes them care about the building and this helped us a lot because afterwards um, when we already found out who developer was uh, when he started making statements online and we also had to make statements online um, we already had some people following us um, when he decided to hold a press conference we on our way decided to uh, to make a demonstration like so that the journalists would go to, to the press conference through our demonstration. We had to get as, as much people as we could. And uh, this is when we knew, like we did get them. We, we got something like 300 people, which is, uh, well, it doesn't sound like really huge for me, but as long as I know uh, in terms of architectural demonstrations, this was this one was like a I don't know a rock concert in Ukraine. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had like three hundred people. Uh, it was a great success. We had a lot of media coverage, and uh, we managed to do it quite a big thing for this niche uh, because of two because of two things. Uh, first of all, right message. <laughs> Right message, because um, by the time when we were doing the demonstration, we already knew that like the building has a lot of, I don't know, like decorative moments, historical things that you uh, could like if you have this aesthetically wise thinking, but nobody cared of it really much. Everybody cared about the grape. Uh, we found it out because uh, when the grape was cut, uh, media started calling us and like doing the live translations and so on. Uh, so we, we got like a lot of engagement when this like crisis thing happened. So we just used it and we were calling people to come to the demonstration because if the developer had already cut the grapes, then what would he do next? Like, could you believe him if he does already that? Not thinking of any of your wills and wishes and that helped us a lot the second thing that really helped us is that at some point we decided we need uh we needed another instrument that would help us uh communicate with our uh with our people even better and we uh, at the moment of this demonstration, we already actually had 6,500 contacts of people who were sympathetic to us. Because before that, 
we decided to open uh, like an open letter to Ministry of Culture with um, a list of what we wanted. Like we wanted this building to have a status, Ministry of Culture could help us do that. That was not actually a petition because for a petition you have to find a lot of, like you have to have 10,000 signs or, or something, which we didn't know we could, like we weren't sure. Uh, and if you're having a petition, you're just registering it on the site of ministry or on the site of administration of your city, something. Uh, so you don't actually. Emails and their telephones, and uh, they would also like agree to get newsletters or any new information for us. So. We're explaining why we needed their help. We started calling some of them in order to ask if they could come. And that really helped. That really helped. <laughs> um, that helped uh, quite much because uh, at the moment when we called them the next time is when the house was really being demolished. It was Thursday, like... 11 a.m. in the middle of workday and um, we had a fantastic engagement like I've actually never seen something like that you well just for comparing we have like four people uh, 4,000 people of, subscri of subscribers on our Instagram and pretty much the same amount on Facebook but the engagement the week of demolition was something like 90,000, which is fantastic. Also, when you have all of those contacts, you could actually ask the people, how do, how do they want you to contact them? Like, what is easier for them? Um, you also ask, like, what do they read? It's just a great source of information because... Um, it's actually, it's just like working with, with your core audience. You just have to know it's uh, really good in, in all the marketing terms. I don't know, like the same as in business. Uh, you just have to know what devices it uh, uses, what values it has and so on. So you can basically ask about it. Um, in our newsletters, we also edit a lot of buttons like for the social media so you could subscribe wherever it's easier for you. At the same moment, we also decided that we needed another social media. Like we had Instagram for engagement, we had Facebook for official statements, and we also had uh, a chat in uh, Telegram. It's one of the messengers quite fast and easy and widespread in Ukraine. Uh, we used it to coordinate our actions. Like uh, we started, uh, we had volunteers shifting, uh, like night shifts, day shifts, uh, safeguarding the building and watching it not to get uh, deconstructed. So uh, we had to coordinate it somewhere and we had to ask people uh, to come to us if we needed them. Uh, this was actually our core of people, those who subscribed, and they were actually the ones who helped us when, like, when we needed real action. Uh, because of the media coverage and because of the people of the amount of people who were sharing the news, we had police reacting quite fast. Like it was just the first day of uh, the first or the second day of uh, the of this like huge. Uh, campaign going on uh, when the police started reacting and we had the decision of court that uh, made the developer stop uh, whatever he was doing and right now the building is arrested for already three months. Uh, the thing I also learned uh, from, from all of this is that you have to use the crisis. Like whenever something really bad happens, in terms of your uh, initiative or like whatever you're doing, um, it doesn't only have the bad sides. Uh, the good thing is that whenever something bad happens, it becomes more interesting for media and it's more interesting for people to share via social media. So you better not just take it like 
really personal to your heart, not not just stay there and think of how bad this is. You better use the situation. Um, this is the great moment for you to start watching what media covers your topic and contact them. Uh, this is the moment when you could reach out to influencers because they would like to say something about the subject. Um, this is actually the moment, like the, the moment of the demolition of the house was uh, the time when we got like some, some 30 to 40 celebrities uh, of national scale commenting on this building in Kiev. This is the moment when the Minister of Culture like you probably don't understand the word, but this is the Minister of Culture of Ukraine who commented on the situation and said that he actually agreed with the initiative that uh, like all the actions of the developer had to be stopped. This is the guy from uh, Kiev city administration. We never had any reactions from uh, Kiev government before that or after that. The moment of the hugest crisis when the media was approaching everybody uh, really hard and asking all the governors, like, what do you think this is? This was the only moment that the city administration reacted and helped us out. Uh, I wish that at this moment we pushed a little bit harder and, uh, and we could actually address him and, I don't know, talk to him like in a better way, not only via social media. Um, also, uh, one of the things that uh, was really great in this crisis situation, uh, this is actually the, uh, the chat that we have in Telegram, it's like 1600 subscribers, uh, those are the active core of people that we could call for help and they would come. Uh, they were the ones who would share the information, who would bring the food to the people. Uh, is our post about searching for <laughs> we don't really have a lot of hands and this is a huge this is a huge process so uh, we were starting to to to, to look for help um, we made this great google form we pushed it uh, like it had quite a good engagement it also had like a couple hundred answers and then we understood that nobody nobody of us was assigned to process these answers like nobody just answered to to the volunteers so we never got any help because we forgot that somebody had to look through all the help proposals uh this is the bad thing don't do something like that um Okay, then another thing that you have uh, to do during the uh, during all this campaigning thing, you have to think of the long term uh, strategy of what's going on. Like, okay, you have this campaign right now, but when you're doing it, uh, you have to keep in mind what's what will be going on like in a year. How do you want this process to end? Who are the stakeholders of all of this process? Uh, in our case, for example, um, we had three stakeholders. First of all, we had all those people who were helping us, uh, like a couple thousand of people sharing the information and being inside the building, saving it. We understood that at the moment when we got inside the house and we actually squatted it for three days, uh, we had to give them the time to relax they were feeling really festive and this was our celebration and like it felt like architectural revolution and when coping with the amount of people like this you have to understand that you cannot like coordinate them sharply you have to let people like do whatever they want but if you see that something's going wrong you should coordinate it like they were staying there until we understood that it is actually completely illegal because house is private property, first of all. And then we also thought that uh, staying on the roof is actually not secure. Uh, so after two days uh, in our own communication, we started shifting the messages towards leaving the house 
and staying outside of the house, like not on the private property, which worked really well because we had this specific tone of voice, um, quite neutral, like friendly, but not in, not too informal uh, because we knew that we had to go to court one day. So all our messages had to be like really, really neutral. And people were trusting us because we never said anything wrong. We never said anything that we wouldn't have checked like 3000 times. So when we said that it was better for the initiative and uh, the future of the house that everybody left, they left. Um, Second thing, like this is a night shift. <laughs> uh, second thing, we had to consider all those people who didn't really care that much and who weren't really our subscribers, but that could help us at some point. And they had to understand that we were not the crazy, the crazy, I don't know, or paid activists or something like that. So uh, we decided to engage the architect of the project uh, the guy who was also offended by, by the action of the developer. And we were the one who, uh, who actually found lawyers who uh, helped him go to court uh, and fight against the, the, the developer. Uh, so at some point we had this public recognition of, of the architect, which helps us a lot in the media space. Uh, third, yeah, third thing, um, we had, uh, yeah, the, the third stakeholder of the process is actually the developer and the people who trust him or like him or supported, support him in some way. Uh, we had to look closely at his rhetoric and understand the points uh, which were not true and which we had to deny publicly uh, and we also had to think of like a good way to do it he was always telling um, that we are fake activists unfortunately uh, this could be the case in ukraine because we have this record of um like yeah actually fake activist teams who just come to the developer and uh, don't let him do the construction until he pays them. This is not our case, but uh, it was really easy for him to, to use this rhetoric so that the business people or someone who has seen like a lot of, of something like that in their previous uh, records, they would believe him and not us. So uh, for some point, a part of people didn't actually believe that we were a activists, that we didn't get any money for this, that we cared about the modernist building, that we cared about this building at all. Uh, so uh, we had to answer all of this in Facebook. This is the moment when we started a lot of work in comments. Uh, and this is when we decided to hold a press conference, which is also uh, a format that I've never used actually. And I'm not sure if it's widely, it's widely spread in activist movement in Ukraine. But yeah, we held a press conference and on it we decided to show the visuals of how the building could look like. Uh, which also was a great... Um, which made a lot of media write about us actually in a positive way. And um, yeah, after it all ended, like we ended the active phase of being around the house uh, and we still understood that now we have to communicate a lot of boring information. Like when you leave, like when you leave the building, uh, it had like demolishment, it had night shifts, it had parties. It was so fun and interesting and people were talking about it a lot of time. And then it all ended and we just needed to hold the attention somehow because the media interest really helps us uh, in what we're trying to achieve. So, um, so in our communication, uh, we are now trying to, uh, first of all, let people know everything that's going on, but in an interesting way. For example, there's a comics that we did about the process of, um, of getting all the documents for building a building <laughs> in, in a city center or something like that. This is extremely boring. 
That's why we found an illustrator who wanted to show in her own way how it works. Um, second thing, uh, to hold people uh, on the spot uh, is, also, is also quite a good thing for us because we just have to show that it lives. Uh, that's why we started making a lot of events on the site. Uh, this is actually a moment when, um, when we were showing a movie like an archive movie, archive movie of 1930s about Kyiv. Um, and there is a fun game about it. Uh, could you spot a single person in a mask on this picture? I know where she is, but <laughs> if you find her also, <laughs> let me know. Um, okay, so yeah, we, we started doing a lot of events, like we had a video mapping on the walls of, uh, of the house. We had this uh, event venue, like uh, movies, speaking clubs, literature evenings. Um, we had live performances with a piano uh, in there. We had yoga, we had uh, lectures, uh, we had workshops, and the latest, the latest thing was a flea market, uh, which is also like, it all aims to get like this neighborhood community and keep people in there all the time, because right now we're challenging another thing. Uh, we all know that probably at some point, uh, the strategy of uh, the developer will be to leave this house abandoned for a couple of years, like not doing anything, uh, which would just make it really uncomfortable for neighborhoods. And thus we will just uh, lose a part of our uh, supporters. Um, so uh, we have to keep people there all the time and create a community around this place. Uh, this is one thing that we're uh, working on. The other thing uh, is that we started thinking of actually uh, working on just this building's future is enough. Uh, because we've had a lot of examples of people not really sharing the experience and not working together, not scaling up, and it never ended well. Uh, this is why using, using the media attention that we had, we decided to unite with uh, around 40 other initiatives in uh, Kyiv. Uh, and this Saturday, we're having a, a march for Kyiv. This is like a united movement that would let march for Kyiv. Uh, this is a united movement that would help uh, people living in Kyiv speak up about their problems. Because as long as we see right now, uh, nor like the government nor city administration. Uh, doesn't see that people in this uh, city have problems. We decided that we could um, that we could actually help our building and achieve our goals only in the case if we level up this conversation and if we go further. So this is what we are working on right now. Uh, we're also using like all of our media tools, uh, the newsletter, all of the social media. Um, go into to traditional media and uh, yeah on TVs something like that even uh, even doing the targeted targeting <laughs> yeah that's uh, thank you Lesia thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, also I remind our participants that if you have any questions you can write it in chat. I suggest that we move the discussion of, uh, of the questions till later after all of the presentations. In cities. And uh, for, for those of you who speak Ukrainian, I would also share with you the podcast episode with one of the members of the initiative Kvito Ukraine that we did uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, for sharing the screen. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, now I'll uh, give the floor to Marta Lampert 
from Initiative Ogolopolski Strike uh, Kobiet. Uh, Marta, the floor is yours, please. Okay, you can see me, but you cannot. I was. I will try the sharing the screen thing, which is always the worst part of everything. And it's like the scary thing. Um, okay, and I closed it, of course. So I'm sorry. Ugh. Yeah, the online thing is doing us obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, if you maybe if you share in the presentations with us, we could share a screen for you. Mm -hmm. I will just try one thing more. Okay, I guess it will open actually. Okay, so now I have the presentation on. And the zone has disappeared. Oh, wait, it's not. Sorry for that, but it's always like that. I'm much better in different things. I cannot invest in everything. So. Okay, I think I have this. Okay, do you see the presentation? Possibly. Yeah. Okay, so I will I will I will just move myself to the I will show you some photos and I will first say what, what the Polish women's striker is, but this is a um, an important experiment for me. Um, Polish Women's Strike is an initiative that has been fighting for women's rights and human rights and democracy in Poland since 2016. We started with the protest against the ban on abortion um, in 2016. It was a civic bill to ban abortion totally in Poland because abortion in Poland is banned, but with exceptions, um, and it was going for a total ban. Um, I am the person who called for the national strike against a national protest against this um, this bill, and in a week, uh, people organized um, the protest on the third of October two thousand sixteen in one hundred and fifty cities, and of course we did that online. So I will speak more about this. Um, and for four years, we've done about two thousand actions and events and protests. Uh, still in 150 cities. And in 2020, when again, the ban was on the table and it was done via the so-called constitutional court, uh, which is not legal, but the ruling, the so-called ruling was there. Um, the number of the cities that are engaged in Polish women's strike grew to 600. So we're now in 600 cities in Poland. And it's not only the protests about women's rights, abortion rights, and, and even human rights. We also protested about judicial independence because it all comes to that. Uh, media freedom against, we did fascist blockade, anti-fascist blockades. We support all the movements that fight for their postulates. And uh, when teachers are on strike, when persons with disabilities were on strike, when the medical personnel is on strike, and so on, so on. So we became, in the meantime, we became one of the biggest help desk organizations that provides um, financing, coordinations, different kinds of support to, uh, to different organizations doing things in Poland. Um, that's, that's the situation we are at now. Uh, and as you can imagine, we organize online. Um, so I will show you the photos now. I'm from. And do you see anything that is uh, the same element in all the photos? Yeah, you have to tell me what it is because it's impossible for me to turn on the chat when I have the presentation here. So somebody has to actually speak. It's an umbrella. Yes, yeah, it's the umbrella thing. Mm -hmm. But see at that, look at that. Then we have here what do we have here. 
we have a visual. And here we have a visual. And here we have the people with umbrellas. And we, here we have the people with umbrellas, actually. And using them to win the protest. And also here. And we also use this because this is. So the thing is that we never do anything online that has no impact or has not a goal to, for things to happen um, in real life. So maybe I'm not even the best person to speak about it because all Facebook actions, all our events, all our groups, all our fan pages, and all our, I think, on, on, all online activity uh, that we have, we, are, we have about half a million people on Facebook, half a million people on Instagram, is just to organize in real life, is for people to act. So there's always, at the end, there is always the, the goal for people to actually take to the streets or do something else, but to actually do something. Uh, we don't do this, uh, we don't do uh, the typical online campaigns ever. So we never did the campaign, like the online campaign that would just result in people being online. But the interesting thing is that we actually started with the online campaign and it's not even us that started that. Uh, the thing that you have heard, I guess, um, that happened in Poland in 2016 was the so-called black protest. And it was actually the internet action. It was an action when people found out about the ban on abortion. I know that the big city academics think that people protested about uh, parliament dropping the bill to legalize. It's not true. People didn't even, didn't even know about it, that there is some bill to legalize. Uh, support for legal abortion then was 37%. We protested against the ban. And that was the action created by Partia Razem, the left wing party. Uh, it was a call for people to wear black and to uh, make a photo, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, more on Facebook, but then, um, and use the hashtag black protest. Uh, and it was an online action that we, of course, are, were inspired. We, we use the black color, it's our major color. Um, they also organized some protests, it was, I think, nine protests in the biggest cities in Poland. Um, the usual protests on the weekend, uh, so nobody gets annoyed or, you know, nothing changes. Um, during one of those protests that were called black protests, I, I called for the national strike then to be held not on the weekend um, and not nicely, but on Monday, the 3rd of October. But yes, it started with the online project that was just, in, in definition, was an online project for people to wear black and to just use the hashtag. But then we added to that, we added the actual thing to do, to go to the protest and then to organize the protest. So that's the, that's the interesting story, I think, because we don't do this kind of actions at all, but we kind of grew from one with the black color. Um, and the second thing that you might, see here the next thing because this is also a recommendation um, is the visuals as you can see we use this stripes and and it's in our logo actually but it started with people doing that it started with of course we had the first visual and i cannot stress enough how important the professional visual visuals are I think that 30% of the success of the first protest, we managed to drop the ban on abortion then, uh, was the visuals. We had the great, because the, the, the protest basically started and the idea started with my partner. She told me about the Icelandic women's strike, um, about Kristina Janda, Polish actress who said that Polish women don't have the solidarity and we, will, we are not capable of doing that. Um, she also told me about that we have to do it on some other day in the weekend because we can, nobody cares about protests on weekends. This is important. Nobody cares about protests on weekends. Nobody. It's a meeting and it's making ourselves feel better. Nobody cares. I don't believe that any government cares. The, the exception is when you have one million people on the streets. Then maybe yes. But less, but less than that, I don't believe that. And we, we don't see that. We don't do that. Uh, except for the particular dates when they just drop on, on weekend. Now we have the fifth anniversary on the 3rd of October, so and it's on Sunday, so we'll be collecting signatures on Sunday. And the thing that also happened was that Natalia, my partner who invented the whole thing, basically, 
um, she asked her friend, who's a really brilliant graphic designer, Olya Shanoska, uh, to make a background for the Facebook event that we started. And that was the most shared image on Facebook back then. It was brilliant, it was great, it was clean, it was pure, and it was professionally made. And I know it's hard to say goodbye to all those ideas that I have a friend who does some graphic design, so maybe he can help us. And if I think, if I think it's ugly, it's ugly. And if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. And if it's not brilliant, it's not brilliant. And this is this just a thing and just a moment that you have to say, no, I don't want that because it's not good enough. It has to be good enough, not because you're the person who can dictate anything. It's because you, it's serving the people. And in the name of the people, you have to provide them with the visuals that they will love, not some visuals that they will just accept. It has to be brilliant. It has to be great. It has to be the best thing. Uh, and, I, and as I say, it's 30% of the first protest was the visuals by Ole Yashanowska. And I, I believe that and I will always say that because that's what, that's what actually happened, that people shared the image. And the, the stripes on the, on the faces are actually taken from the first logo that we had. Uh, you can see the logo, uh, it's on the left. It was just a woman's head with the name, with, uh, saying that we're not, we're not going to work, we're not going to work on the 3rd of October, and the stripe that was then used by people on the streets actually uh, <coughs> during the first protest. We then changed the logo, but it's the first one and it's still recognized by most of the people. And then there was a modification, there was the international women's strike. As you can see, people that was so good and so brilliant that people from different countries, mostly from Latin America, took the idea, took the image and made it their own and, and presented many, many modifications. So the woman's head that started Polish protests 2016 is still there and is still being used. And it was also used, of course, not without asking and without admitting that it was the inspiration by the Women's March in the US uh, also. As you can see that there are different faces also, different figures. And it was something about diversity that, that we didn't uh, have because of course Poland is really homogenic uh, or we think. Uh, and then we saw this modification, it was something really that changed also our, our vision, how it looks. And then you can see the real life thing. We changed the logo and this is, <coughs> this is a photo from Van Gojavo. It's really close to the Russian border. Elisa, who is standing on the tractor, is a farmer. And then you can see the flag with Polish women's strikes, the new logo with the lightning bolt. Uh, we changed that at some point. And this is the real life use. This is, and also the international women's strike um, logo. That's how it happens when you do it professionally, when you do it properly, people will use that, people will put that out, people will use the, the visuals that you provide them with, but it has to be good, it has to be nicely done. We had t-shirts, of course, we have, um, with the logo, we're not very, we're not very um, obsessed with the logo staying as it is, so you can see that for LGBT persons support, we use the lightning bolt that is in rainbow, when we support teachers, it's orange, and so on, so on. Uh, there are different ways to express that. And we have really nice photos of that being used. And the next recommendation is the posters. It's the easiest thing ever. And it's just actually an anecdote. We had this big protest in 2018 and we were supposed to print 1000 posters of the event. Um, and the printing house kind of made a mistake, a uh, very supportive printing house made a mistake and they, they made 10,000 of those posters instead of 1000. And we didn't know what to do with them. And we just started giving it them out to the people during the protest. And it's, it turned out that it's the best thing that people would, would make photos with them, that then you have the photos from the protest with people just carrying the posters, not some particular gadgets, not the pins and not something that we even prepared for that day. It's the posters of the event. As you can see, this is just the date and, um, and, and the logo. 
uh, and that was and people were just taking that and, and carrying it and, and making photos of it. So and it was just by accident. We didn't think of that. We, we thought of the posters, the event posters of something that is put on the streets, on the walls, on the buildings to to advertise to, to add the event, not to give it to the people during the protest. And it turned out that yeah, that we're doing that. This is my favorite photo because this is a Catholic cathedral building here in Wrocław. And we are at war with church, as you can imagine. Um, and the pins, of course. Uh, this is not the idea that I like, but I guess it works. Uh, presenting that. This is the. This is one of the. This is the quote actually from me. I gave the speech when uh, the legal abortion bill was dropped, but not by the 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 ruling party, but it was by the uh, by the opposition people in the parliament who just didn't show up to the voting. And we were very angry and we were also frustrated. And then I gave the speech that uh, we have to stick to what we do. So for example, when the police approaches us and says, attention, attention, this is the police. We say, attention, attention, this is the citizens. And this is the next recommendation. Saying that we are the, we are the biggest group always. So they might have as we have now the police violence and everything else. They might have uniforms, police, media, but when you count the numbers, there's always more people because citizens are always the biggest group. They're bigger than military. They're bigger than institutions. They're bigger than governments. They're bigger, they're bigger than parliaments. In numbers, when you count the people, we are always the biggest group. It's, it's just that it, it adds like that. So the citizenship thing, and the thing that we have, that our biggest weapon is that we are more. There are always more people fighting for things than the whole organized institutions that fight against us. And we base really, but this is the feminist movement thing. So we base a lot on history, we base a lot on history of solidarity, but we also base a lot on the, the suffragist movement and emancipation movement, of course. Uh, this is something that we did, and this is another example. We did this uh, visual for the pedophilia uh, crimes in, in, in Polish church when we protested against that. And you, then you can see it happening again. So we provided the visual, the clear uh, thing. What, what do you have to do to, to be connected to find the shoes and put them on the church's gate, on the churches? And that action was about 90 churches in Poland on one day. And we didn't expect that, I expected 20 churches. So it's also a war. I think it also worked because there was a clear message. What can you do to express how angry you are? And then we have, and these are the, this is the next thing, uh, the language. We became a massive movement because one of the reasons that we are a massive movement is that we speak how we speak. And this is important, speaking how we speak, meaning we don't have the different language for how we speak at home and how we speak to friends and to how we speak online and how we speak in public events. Uh, and I, I don't, it's really hard to translate whatever it says. One, one of the posters there says, uh, always fucking something. And this, uh, the other says, fuck you. And we, uh, we all use that. And in the protest last year, uh, when we protested against the abortion ban, the major chant and the major banner was Wypierdalać, which means fuck off. And we had this banner prepared for some other action. And then we put this out when, when we were in the Constitutional Court building. And people took that banner and carried it 13 kilometers to Żoribosz, to, Żoribosz, to Kaczyński's house. And this is our answer to, you shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't convince people to swear and use these bad words. People would not carry the banner for 13 kilometers if they didn't have these words in them at that moment. Um, but there was a whole discussion, of course, that women shouldn't be you know, so nasty. Uh, I love that. Danka Kuron, who is a solidarity legend, then wrote um, an article that Wypierdalać, that fuck off, is not a, a curse word anymore. It's a political program because it, and that, that was that, that people were angry about everything. And we also had banners now we are about everything. It was like anti-government, but it was very strong. And yeah, you can see that. And these are quite nasty words. Uh, this says, fuck no. 
And this is the, you know, the, the, the best banner ever because it fits every situation and every demonstration. Uh, and we also use that. And this is from that, as you can see the difference, this is 2016. So we, we still had the, you know, the star, so it's not, um, but now we have the eight stars. I don't know if you've seen from Poland, five stars plus three stars means, means here about peace, which means fuck the government basically. And it's everywhere, it's on the cars and on the buildings and everywhere. This is also from 2017. And then we have the symbol of the hanger also. It's a symbol of, of, of illegal abortion, of unsafe abortion. And we also use that symbol. It's an old symbol and it, it's, 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 it doesn't even happen anymore, the abortions with, with the hangers. But we still use that uh, more now as a torture tool and something that points basically to the church. As you can see, this is the church gate again. And people doing things like that. This is also easy. Everybody has a hanger at home. Uh, then we move. This is the legal abortion action. And the one thing that we decided to do at some point was to take the Argentinian experience because we're very close. We we're, we're much closer to Latin America with abortion laws than to any other country, um, than to countries in Europe. Uh, so we use the Argentinian green. We use the Argentinian narrative, especially now when they won. They, they've tried for 15 years, they tried nine times, and now they have legal abortion. Uh, so we did also these actions. Uh, lighting the buildings, it's very, it's very cheap and it's very easy. It's just putting the foil on those lights uh, and, the, and the, the slums that you have in the sidewalks uh, when you have the buildings that are being, um, yeah, well, as you can see, this is the cathedral actually for legal abortion, the green one. And we've actually managed to make the green as we, first made the black and, and the red the colors of the protest, we made the green uh, in Poland the color of legal abortion. And we pushed that very hard, this narrative. And the color thing is also, I know that we have so many ideas for visuals and symbols. The colors are the basic. Just pick the color and stick to it and it, it works. We can show you with how the, the legal abortion color thing um, in Poland works. It really works. Yeah. And then you can see again, we have the visuals here, but this is the door of the church in Zgorzelec, next to the border, very small city, and people putting the hanger and the green scarf there. So again, we all, whatever we do online, providing people with visuals with anything they need, leads to the action when it's done right. If it doesn't lead to the action, it means that we're doing something wrong. Yeah, we also use this connection, Argentinian connection, and as you can see, this actually works. And we provide, of course, the pins and, and materials and things. Oh, this is the, the government building, also the green for legal abortion. Uh, it's really nice thing to do, to make the colors on the buildings. Um, yeah, and that's that. I, I know I talk a lot about visuals because I think this is the, the important thing. The next thing is providing people with whatever they need. Uh, we have this rule that people act in their own territories how they want. And this is really strange. And this is something that was really hard to accept. We are post-Soviet, uh, obviously we're post-Soviet nation. So the idea that nobody rules and there's no management board was quite kind of scary. I had those interventions, people saying, uh, Marta City A wants to do this and that, and I think it's a bad idea. And I had to answer, but you're in the city B and I'm in Wrocław and we have no idea how it is in city A. And people there are actually adults. They put their lives on the line. They put their bodies on the line. They put their names and faces. So maybe, just maybe, we can assume that they know what they're doing. And what turned out, uh, we made, <laughs> I actually counted that. With 1,500 events, we had two situations when we had to explain ourselves to the press. So imagine building the whole monitoring control system to avoid those two, just two exceptional situations when something went wrong, opposed to, to this 1,498 where people knew what they were doing and, and nothing bad happened. Uh, but this is within us. And we have people who organize events like um, exhibitions for women's voting rights uh, anniversary. And we have Clementina Suhanov uh, jumping over the so 
so they say, the police, jumping over the uh, Constitutional Court's fence uh, and throwing eggs at the prime minister's car. And we are not the ones to judge. And we don't have one path to follow. People know, absolutely know what they are doing. They need money, money is very important. And we, we can pretend that it's not, it's very important. Uh, coordination, media coverage, and good professional visuals, uh, inspiration for actions, and one place uh, on the internet to find out what's going on, and a group to talk to each other, because we are mostly uh, in small and, and middle-sized cities. And people who are afraid that they will be just three persons protesting, meet other 50 people who are also afraid that there will be three people protesting. And now that then they make a group of 150 people and it's much better than. So, so this is what we provide. This is the services that we have. And with the young generation, we see that this client thing that we had, I'm 42, so we still have some kind of this post-Soviet thing with asking and, and reporting and negotiating. Young people come and say, we are doing a protest against the education reform. We need megaphones. Uh, we need you to send out the press release for us. And we need someone to be there for the anti-rep, for the, for the lawyers that we have, that, that we have the collective of lawyers uh, for people who are being detained. And that's that. And I'm so happy. They don't ask and they are not like, oh, please, please help us. They know that they deserve that because they are doing things and we are the, the aunts of the revolution and we are supposed to, uh, to provide that to them. And I cannot stress that. The, the management board system, the corpo system, uh, whatever up and down system in NGOs and civic movements has to end, like now. Uh, on the national level, we are help desks. And I'm a help desk. I'm not the leader of the management board ruling the country of two of 600 groups like an army. I'm a responsible for national help desk for 600 local groups that do amazing things, things you wouldn't believe what people are, are capable of. And I think that's that. That's, these are the recommendations. Uh, the online thing is always for the offline thing. And people know what they are doing. And the visuals are the most important and we have to stop pretending that it's not, it is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marta, for this great speech and for the inspiration. And now we also have one more presentation from Daniel Gutierrez from Germany and from the Social Housing uh, Initiative. Uh, Daniel, I would invite you now to, to the floor and also I would ask Marta, do you stop mm -hmm. sharing your screen? It's not that easy, but I will try. <laughs> ah, yeah, I think it works. Thank you. And Daniel, here you go. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see that? Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, I want to take the opportunity to thank um, everyone for allowing me to be here and also to say that I'm incredibly grateful to share the stage um, with such comrades. And I'm uh, way more interested in learning from them and the others here present. Um, that said, uh, I also want to immediately apologize because this will not be the most um, prepared um, presentation because we've been really busy as the referendum in Berlin was this Sunday and um, it was a victory and it was a unexpected uh, victory um, for many of us. So uh, we've been quite busy. Um, that said, um, in difference to um, the presentation we just heard, I'm going to focus more on the kind of organizational aspects without denying at all the importance of everything um, that was just said, um, but to kind of complement it on the other side. Um, so, um, I want to underscore three key takeaways from the campaign. First, that the campaign was the result of a long-term organizational process. Um, that is, that this was only possible because people remained committed to the process. Um, not only to the process, but to critically evaluate each cycle of struggle in order to experiment in new ways in subsequent cycles. 
In this way, it's critical to understand this process as one of learning over time. Um, secondly, uh, the campaign was remarkably capable of developing structures that allowed organizing know-how to circulate across the apparatus, uh, massively expanding the area of activation, allowing unprecedented amounts of people to step into roles, resulting in a game-changing multiplication of forces over time. Um, Thirdly, while the campaign did rely on different digital tools and platforms, Zoom, Big Blue Button, Telegram, um, we also had our very own app, TikTok, Instagram, all of these things, um, underneath this digital superstructure, uh, we still relied on more classical organizational structures that were centered on uh, collective care and relationship building. Um, the digital, as you will notice, will not be so important at the beginning of this, but over the course of this presentation, I hope you notice that it takes on more and more importance, especially as Corona comes around. At the same time, I want to um, decentralize the digital a bit and to just kind of put it in a series of things in order to think of it as a medium or an infrastructure which operates within a web work of other structures and infrastructures that only make sense according to the relations. So. Um, let's get into this. Um, I want to begin by stating that this process was again defined by experimentation, but most importantly by adaptation and learning, right? Um, this referendum is the outcome of a long-term organizational process that developed in response to the privatization of Berlin's public housing in 2004. As uh, Deutsche Wohnen Co. and Eichmann founders explain, capital investment firms saw housing in Berlin as a safe harbor of investment, um, particularly in the context of the subsequent financial crisis of 2007-2008. Housing and right to the city initiatives formed against rising rents and urban redevelopment projects focused on profit accumulation. Over the years, an amalgam of individual initiatives met um, each met dead ends, as these initiatives came to realize the necessity of a broader, more systemic approach to the housing crisis. Um, it was in 2016 that Tenant Initiative Koti uh, & Co. first put expropriation on the table. Um, um, and that kind of followed alongside this um, a uh, referendum to reform public housing in 2015 um, that was ultimately struck down due to legal complications. It was after these, uh, sorry, it was after these initiatives, um, after these experiences that tenant initiatives from across the city combined with activists from the 2015 referendum under the banner of uh, to expropriate corporate landlords. So basically you have all these different kinds of experimentations to uh, solve the problem. Each one meets a dead end. And then there's a recombination in 2016, 2017 around um, developing a referendum to actually expropriate um, landlords that own more than 3000 uh, properties. This is already novel. Um, I study working class organization, been involved in the social movement since 2011, and typically organizations are defined by a kind of rigidity of approach. Organizations, if they endure past their initial cause of creation, tend to recycle the same strategies uh, and tactics over and over and over again, no matter the scenario, right? Um, which is what you should be kind of defining what strategies and tactics to use. Here, however, what you see are different objectives, stopping the construction of uh, mega projects like the media spree following the financial crisis, stopping rent hikes and reforming public housing, attempting to be secured through different strategies, um, event focused protests, base building and organizing and electoral campaigns before ultimately recombining into a singular objective, the expropriation of housing through a combination of all three of those tactics, event-based protests, base building and organizing and signature collection and get out the boat tactics. Rather than repeat the same strategies and tactics over and over again, hoping that conditions are more favorable each time, they adapted re responding to feedback from each experiment. 
What's more, it's critical to understand that this process of that adaptation was only possible um, because it was a process of learning. And um, it was a process of a certain kind of learning how to organize. And that responds to the need to know um, how to best organize, this, organize resources in hostile environments in order to achieve goals. So this knowledge, of course, um, can it can either be developed intrinsically or extrinsically or both. In other words, people can develop it themselves or they can be taught. How to do the latter is self-evident, right? You go to a workshop, someone teaches you how to do an online organ or how to do online facilitation or how to have one-on-ones. Um, but how to do it uh, yourself is a bit trickier. Unless people intentionally develop structures for collective learning and reflection, this knowledge remains largely trapped in the minds of discrete individuals. It's only through formal uh, structures, trainings, workshops, debriefs, evaluation mechanisms, or informal structures over beers after meetings, for example, that people come to collectively learn how to organize better. What is critical to underscore is that over the long-term process that led up to the Enteignen or to the expropriation, tenant initiatives and political organizations had developed collective mechanisms to reflect on their actions. In this way, we can speak of a development of a certain kind of militant minority function, a kind of function within a local movement ecology that specializes in the accumulation of political potential, capacities and resources, making it particularly capable of forming the organizing cores that sustain uh, initiatives behind the scenes. Over the long-term process, we see an expansion of potential, of resources, capacities beyond that original core of uh, original initiatives, developing an apparatus dedicated to the distribution of such a knowledge. So over the organizational process, different structures developed across multiple organs within the organization that together formed an apparatus dedicated to capacity building through circulating this organizing know-how. Firstly, we need to underscore the importance of Stadthilfe AG, or Jumpstart Working Group. Within the campaign structure, Jumpstart functioned to assist tenants in jumpstarting individual tenant initiatives that organized themselves against their landlords from 2016 to 2019. In this way, individual tenants could call on the Jumpstart Working Group, right? Like you have a problem with your landlord, you could call Jumpstart and then be like, hey, I have a problem with my landlord. And then um, Jumpstart would say, if you can get three, other of your, three more of your neighbors, we'll call on a pool of uh, blitzers, and then we will help you knock on all the doors of your neighbors, um, help them host their first meeting, guide them in identifying shared issues, and help them develop a campaign against their landlord, after which they would leave, right? So they would come in and help jumpstart initiatives and then um, like basically seed something, water it, let it grow a little bit and then walk away. Um, so this greatly expanded the initial area of activation and helped in forging a primitive accumulation of activists for the rest of the campaign. Meanwhile, the Keats teams, in coordination with the uh, collection working group, were, um, were developed as a decentralized and largely autonomous network of neighborhood teams that were tasked first with collecting signatures across the boroughs of the city in order to get the referendum on the ballot, um, and then to knock doors in order to get out the vote. Um, argumentation trainings and one on trainings were regularly provided throughout these entire, through both processes, through both phases. And apps were also created that allowed people to then plug in to find out okay, what kind of signature collection actions are happening near me, or um, what kind of door knocking um, events are happening near me. And so this greatly lowered the barrier of participation. Because one, you provided trainings for people to get over this German fear. I mean, it's really everywhere, right? Like, oh my God, I couldn't possibly talk to a stranger about politics. Like, what do you mean you want me to knock on their door? 
they're probably going to spit on my face. And then going through a training where you build the confidence, you practice how to have a structured organizing conversation, and then you go out with a bunch of people, so you're not alone, and then you go and knock on doors, and then you find out, oh my God, no one has spit on my face, and this was actually a really beautiful experience to talk to a bunch of neighbors about something incredible. So, um, Lastly, there's the Right to the City Working Group that was developed in order to simultaneously provide a space for foreigners blocked from participating in the election to build their own organizational structures <coughs> within the campaign and to scandalize this democratic deficit in the referendum. Something like 25% of uh, tenants in Berlin are actually foreigners that do not have any legal rights to vote. Um, this is part of the, this is the working group that I come out of. So this was made possible by a number of jumpstart comrades that basically did the same process of planting, like seeding, watering and letting it grow, but within the organization. Um, and they started this uh, English language based section of the campaign and recruited English speaking, uh, an English speaking core of organizers with significant organizing know-how. And this also helped um, within that section to develop a number of trainings in terms of how to do online facili uh, facilitation, how to talk to the media, how to do one-on-one -on -one conversations. There was also different practices of mentorship and guidance within that working group. And we also regularly used surveys in order to identify um, what kind of skills needed to be developed for example. Um, what holds across all three working groups was the importance of training and capacity building. To varying degrees, trainings and training and capacity building mechanisms were critical features of all three functions, allowing people with different capacities to develop new ones. From trainings and videos on how to facilitate online meetings to argumentation and one-on-one -on -one training, offering mentorship and developing strategy sessions to helping tenants organize their first meetings with their neighbors, structures were created that allowed people to step into new and often uncomfortable roles with support and guidance, giving them the confidence to take these tasks on their own and making and thus multiplying the overall resources that the organization pooled over time. Um, these various structures made it possible for uncommon amounts of people to get involved in very concrete and meaningful ways, broadly expanding the pool of accumulated resources, allowing many to remain involved over the long term. This is a photo of one of our one-on-one uh, -on -one trainings. And then here we also have the creation of cheerleading working group. Um, that was developed also within the foreigner section and then became the, the central, um, like it's on all the newspapers, basically, for the past three weeks or so. So this brings us to the importance of collective care and relationship building. Um, within the organization as a whole, but particularly within the Right to the City Working Group, which formed in December of 2020, right when the lockdown really closed in on us. And so we had this group of strangers that forms purely online, right? Also foreigners, like people coming from Southern Europe, people coming from Eastern Europe, people coming from, um, what's it called? Uh, the Americas, people coming from all over the place that are suddenly expected to organize with one another <laughs> over a lockdown. So collective care and relationship building played a critical role particularly because this was developed in the, the winter lockdown. If strangers were going to come together and stay together through struggle, it wasn't at all going to be enough to just give trainings and hand out tasks. Like, all right, we need you to do this, this and that. Here's how you do it, go out and do it, right? Like you needed to build more than that. Um, we needed to build community and trust during some of our darkest hours. No doubt, this was particularly a challenge given the online environment in which we had to operate. To help facilitate this, one-on-one -on -one phone calls and check-ins um, became standard practice within R2C's Reproduction Organizing Task Force. 
providing emotional support for our comrades when they uh, felt lost or burned out. If we noticed that someone was upset in the meeting, if we noticed someone was feeling overwhelmed, we'd call them and ask them how they're doing and essentially um, do some active listening on how they're feeling. And then if they're overwhelmed, we would try to um, spread resources around, right? Like, okay, if you have too many tasks, then we try to distribute that across the, the network. <laughs> This collective understanding was fortified by the deployment of consciousness raising sessions um, that absolutely helped us to understand each other um, and the organizational experiences we were coming out of and bringing to the table. And consciousness raising is this old feminist practice that comes out of the 1970s in, um, I think it's first started out of the US. Um, and it was kind of developed as a, as a way for like housewives to kind of collectively get together because there was no text on patriarchy prior to that, right? And so they would get together and then talk about shared experiences and then develop shared analysis, uh, analyses, et cetera. So um, we use this here and by asking one simple question and allowing everyone present to speak as much as they want about it, like, how do you feel when you tell a German that you're going to stay in, uh, stay in Germany? And then you just allow everyone to talk once for as long as they want about it. Um, the, the, another consciousness raising question was on the second session was um, regarding organizational experiences that you're coming out of. What do you never want to happen again? And what do you want to see happen in this group? Because you know people will have fucked up organizational traumas, right? Like, oh yeah, I was in other groups, and in other groups this happened, in other groups that happened. Um, I can't believe that I was instrumentalized in this way, etc. So these were things that we needed to know in order to be able to contextualize all the voices that we're seeing in a Zoom meeting, right? And then be like, okay, this isn't some kind of personal thing that someone has against me. I'm situating them in a continuum of their own kind of life experiences. Um, so um, this gave us the understanding that we were more than objects that needed to be moved in the right place, but full complex human beings with genuine concern for each other in the project. Over time, our onboarding practices became far more attuned to individual um, needs of people looking to join. Instead of simply inviting prospective members to a meeting, two people were assigned, and these are online meetings, right? So before they jump into an online weekly or uh, biweekly meeting, um, two people are assigned to meet with new recruits in order to brief them about the organization and what to expect out of the coming meeting. And then um, those same people would be tasked uh, with offering guidance during the new recruits first meeting via chat. So we'd just be like, uh, hey, Ethan, how are you doing? Are you hanging in there? Is this confusing? Don't worry about this thing. This is completely uh, erroneous and you don't have to concern yourself at all. This is just someone going on a tangent or something like that, right? Um, and then people were assigned to individually debrief with them afterwards, preferably in person now, in order to find out why they wanted to join and which working group can best actualize that personal desire and still help the organization. Um, in combination with the trainings, this allowed people uh, a guided experience that, um, that met people where they were according to their capacities. Um, care was also a primary theme that ran through our social or through our media narrative. Our most famous media production, a product of um, Right to the City as well, and I will plug that in real quick, actually. Um, one second here. I just want to share. Where did that go? Um, bum, bum, bum. Um, basically, um, this was our most famous media production. It also came out of the, the Right to the City working group. And I absolutely agree um, with Marta that you, uh, you have to pay for the goods and the goods pay back. Um, I will drop that in the chat right now and then go back to 
sharing the screen. Pa, pa, pa. Yeah, so it's centered on the fact that the financialization of housing blocks our very ability to care for ourselves and our loved ones as we would like to and as we actually need to. Um, lastly, we also underscored the importance of social gatherings, like really fundamental, as a way to deepen relations, trust, uh, relationships, trust, and community. Even in the midst, midst of a harsh winter lockdown, we had an online social event using... Um, Online, yeah, here we go, um, using Gather. I don't know if anyone has ever used this. It's basically like Zoom, but a Nintendo uh, Game Boy kind of deal. And so you could like walk around um, a space that I created this space, it's called Expropriated Property. And then um, you can go say to that little TV that's right there, and then watch something collectively on YouTube. But then people that are sitting at this table over here do not listen to the, the video or watch it. So it allowed you to kind of like do what people do in real life when it's like, okay, this conversation is uncomfortable. I want to walk away now and then move to another conversation. Completely allowed this. And people were like, we did an online survey prior to that and also had phone calls with a bunch of people and people were like, I don't know if I wanna go to some stupid online meeting in February when I want to die because it's cold outside and there's a lockdown and this is never going to end. And then like 30 people went and everyone was like, holy shit, this is the best fucking thing that happened all fucking winter. Um, and we got, again, like we got to know each other, right? And really trust each other. So this was a critical success um, also because it was our first uh, social event and it was fucking online. And as soon as we were allowed to go outside, um, we organized a rally in June that developed a space of politicized collective joy in the city's uh, famous Tempelhof airfield. The event was one part techno. Um, it was probably like 10 parts techno uh, and uh, one part uh, political education about the differential uh, statuses of migrants in relation to housing in Berlin. Um, and it was a huge success, right? Like everyone in the media was like, what the fuck just happened? This was some kind of happening and foreigners organized this and they also want to expropriate housing. Um, so, and then in our July strategy session, um, following the, the, the collection of signatures, where we then had to figure out where do the foreigners fit themselves into the next phase, which is the get out the vote phase. Um, Again, we really centered the importance of food in that we organized like 15 people to individually cook at home shit that they love. And also since it's foreigners, everyone bought a bunch of different things. I brought Mexican food, everyone freaked out. And it built, built this collective bond that everyone was like, oh my God, this is really great to know everyone. And this is how you end up with a photo of a bunch of strangers that met in a fucking lockdown that are like, we're in it to win it. Um, so yeah, um, this is about it. The battle um, for Berlin is far from decided. Berlin's likely incoming social de democratic mayor, uh, Franziska Giffey, ran with the promise that she would stop the referendum in its tracks upon election. In the week prior to the election, the centrist social democrats announced that they will also be buying almost 15 houses, uh, 15,000 houses back from corporate landlords in a plain attempt to kind of diminish support. Like, you don't need the, this referendum. Look at us, we just bought 15,000 houses, you know? Um, which is also crazy. It's crazy because um, the way that we pan, plan on paying back the capitalists for, um, for the houses is also by not giving them any money right now, but by giving them bonds, right? Like over 40 years, like you get so many bonds that these bonds will then um, pay you a cut of people's rents for 40 years, which is incredibly, I think it's pretty fucking smart because you don't have to give any money right now out of city coffers. But then again, the centrists are doing this and it's incredible. Anyways, however, Giffey has also clearly been shaken by the strong results that won 56.4%. <coughs> and in interviews following the final tally of the referendum results, Giffey has remarked that while she still does not believe expropriation would help a single household, uh, 
the results must be respected um, so long as they are legal. And so I'm sure that the social democrats will now comb through this with a fine tooth comb in order to find anything to stop this. Um, but given the, the incredible momentum behind the, uh, the, uh, the campaign, I think it would be quite crazy if they actually tried to do that, which I'm sure will still happen. But that's about everything that I got, team. Um, thanks again for everything. Thank you, Daniel, for this presentation. And now we have time for your questions and discussion. Um, there are two options of how you could ask a question. You could either write your question in chat or you could raise a hand and speak up, which is going to be better because we will be um, discussing. So um, if any of you have any questions to any of the speakers right now, Please uh, show yourself. Mm, but uh, while you are still gathering your thoughts and uh, forming your questions, I will ask a question <laughs> from our speakers. Uh, um, and uh, um, I would like to ask you about uh, portraying of social activism in traditional media in newspapers and on TV, because sometimes we see, like, especially in Ukraine, how uh, the, I don't know, the opposition of social movements got the hold of this narrative in traditional media. And uh, is it possible, do you think, to, and how is it possible uh, to get a hold of this counter narrative and how to use this traditional media for your campaigns? Mm -hmm. yes, okay, yeah, um, I think I'll start. Uh, well, actually, I work uh, I work as a PR uh, person. So uh, this is actually just something that you need to know if you want to, if you want the media to, uh, to say things that you want to hear about you, you should probably talk to them. Uh, like, this is, th this is just how it works. Um, first of all, try to contact the media and reach them. Um, second of all, uh, have all the thesis, I, I don't know the English word, I'm sorry for this, like, uh, you just have to know what points you want to highlight, uh, you want to always repeat them as much as you can, you should have them short, precise, and always the same, and, um, this will help you with, um, uh, with print media in case if it's like if you don't have the situation in which you're actually fighting against the government uh, which holds the media <laughs> which is a completely different thing uh, and it happens in Ukraine also but didn't happen in our case uh, but yeah if we're talking about like the traditional media situation you just have to keep on saying what you need to be heard and repeating it all the time in all your messages in all your communication channels on the site in the newsletter and in all your media appearances yeah. Thank you, Lessa, Marta, Danielle. If you have anything to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one, one thing just briefly, because um at first when when I when I heard about the, the development of the cheerleading working group, I thought that that was um not absurd or anything like that, but I was like, okay, like whatever people can do, whatever they want. And I didn't think of the actual genius of this, uh, like Berlin is a very migrant city and um, Berlin is also known for being a very queer city. And then um, the combination of um, these factors um, just really made brilliant sense for the media to like pick it up. And it was like, yeah, of course, um, everyone loved this because it's, one, it's bizarre in general, but then that fits in with the kind of broader narratives that the city has about itself. And so the media media just really ate that up. Um, and it just started as a joke, like after a meeting, like over food that someone was like, imagine if we just made like a cheerleading working group. Um, and then it was everywhere, but yeah. 
that's all I got. Thank you, Daniel. I see that we now have questions in chat, but also we have a hand from Julian. Uh, Julian, speak up. Uh, your microphone is turned off or you change your mind. Um, your microphone is still off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My, my question goes to Lesia as a PR expert. Um, you explained, you are laughing, aren't you? <laughs> you explained um, the, how to uh, get in contact with traditional media, but my um, question is, um, is it worth to get in contact with traditional media and do you still need uh, traditional media at all? And if you need it, um, what for? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, this uh, always has to base on the audience that you're trying to talk to. If you understand that you already reached all the people that you wanted to reach and they understood you clearly, then probably you don't need any other media at all. Uh, if you know that there is a lot of people who do not still know about your case and they could help you, uh, and the only way to reach them is actually through the media that they uh, use. And this media is like mass media, like magazines, newspapers, TV, something like that. Then you should probably take this, take this opportunity and use it. Thank you, Lester. And um... did I answer? <laughs> Hope so. Uh, and so uh, we have a few questions in chat, and uh, I'll try to try to read them. The first one is uh, for Daniel. Um, did you use Gazer Town rather for socializing or as well for some sort of political assembly? Um, I've used Gather Town in two different ways, mainly as a social thing, um, and that works really nicely. Um, but it has to be enticing. So I think the only times when that really makes sense is in a lockdown scenario, or if there's no other way to kind of socialize, right? Like say, because of distance, right? Um, like say, if you were trying to organize some kind of social event with a bunch of people from across the country and you can't get everyone in one place, you could consider using this for that kind of thing. Um, I've also used it for providing trainings. Um, but I prefer using Zoom and Google Docs, um, which is also the other thing is that at the beginning of this lockdown, I got a training myself on how to do online facilitation um, through this um, movement school that I'll put a link to. Um, and that was absolutely game changing because um, I provided some core people with that online facilitation training. And then we also created a video of that online facilitation training. And then that just spread through Telegram. And then suddenly everyone was really comfortable with doing online facilitation quite quickly and much faster than it would have happened without that training. Um, but yeah, so I prefer using Zoom and uh, Google Slides because that's how I was trained. Um, but I'm sure that you could use it also for something like that. And I'm sure you could use it for political assemblies, but then you have to pay once you get past a certain amount of people. And so that's a problem. That's a barrier. But if you have the money, perhaps that makes sense. Also, I've just seen that uh, Marta written in the chat uh, that you're back. Maybe you wanted to add something to the, the first questions that we discussed about traditional media. I think that traditional media are still important because the kind of like, get to, to different group and especially with our work when we are uh, obviously a feminist organization but we are mostly the pro-democratic organization and we are the anti-government organization we're the major anti-government organization 75 percent of people uh, in poland support polish women's strike which means twice the government was then uh, not to mention the political parties on the opposition who has it, have it much lower um, the, the traditional media, even if it's a hate campaign, still 
make the the thing heard and and visible and these are of course different groups that there are different groups on tiktok on instagram on facebook but especially to get the establishment persons and we need them of course uh to get engaged we need the traditional media there's no other way and of course it also works uh when as i said it also works with it's a hate campaign so 89 percent of people in poland know about polish women's strike thanks and and at least half of it is uh, due to the government television that does some campaigns against us um, and 69 people 69 percent of people in poland actually know my name and my face um and 80 percent of that is because of the national media campaign against me the government media campaign uh, which means uh, really dozens and, and hundreds of materials um about how an evil person i am uh but at some point it's just whatever it's is being done it's still the message somehow even if it's distorted and manipulated gets out um and the recognition is the most important thing because then people can turn and people actually turn to to other media and people talk to uh, to the persons around them so whatever works i would say um for some right-wing um, neo-fascist outlets that have big outreach in poland um we actually owe them the fact that the opposition media cover us so Sometimes it's the right-wing media, it's the radical um, neo-fascist media that put our message without even commenting it as a scandal and everything else to their uh, listeners and, and people who, who watch them. And then the, the opposition media or the mainstream media um, actually see that they actually also have to cover what we do. So we owe a lot of coverage in the mainstream media, in the opposition media and the free media to the writing outlets and to the government coverage. Um, so yeah, this is important. This is important. And of course it can happen without that, but uh, we still live in the society that uses traditional media, obviously. Um, and we talk about young people all the time. Uh, most of the, the, the biggest group within, among women, the biggest group that supports Polish women's rights are women who are actually 50 plus. Uh, and that's that. And of course, we have this whole narrative about the young people, and, and we have the young people um, at the core, but the 50 plus persons, the 60 plus, plus persons are very, very important, and they don't use, use the social media as much as the young people do. And we cannot just, just skip that, and we cannot build a new world only in social media because it just doesn't work like that. Thank you. We have now time for two more questions that are already in the chat. And the first one is uh, for Marta as well. Uh, Marta, um, as Strike Viet is present in a lot of civic discourses all over Poland, are you currently involved in actions creating visibility from what happens at the Polish-Belarusian border? Yes, uh, we do different type of actions. We um, are basically help desking the um, the organizations, the pro-refugee organizations that work at the border. So we provide them with financing the, the helpline actually uh, some equipment some transport and so on and so on because this is our law role so we put some part of the of our budget and our coordination and our resources to that and we also participate in the action to force um, the polish red cross which is acting horribly uh, along with the government uh, lying that they cannot help the persons at the polish Belarusian border um, so we are very involved in the action to force Polish Red Cross to actually act. Um, of course, uh, there are also anti-government protests and, uh, and the whole uproar about that. And there are demonstrations organized, but we're, mar we're much more focused on supporting the organizations that are there. So consortium and the, the border team and Ocalenia is the foundation that was in Ustnash when the, the whole thing blew. Um, and in providing the coverage within our social media because we have the, the, the biggest outreach. Um, the thing is that we see that the pro-refugee organizations uh, at that point are in the same situation as we were a year ago when we grew from 150 cities and to 600 cities in two weeks. And 
our communication grew about 10 times 10 times more so our all communication channels got stuck at some point and we use that experience to help them uh, including the psycho emergency program that we have including the including the the legal aid program that we have uh, we have the psycho emergency program for persons with uh, ptsd and the burnout the activist burnout so we also put that part of the program towards the pro refugee uh, workers and volunteers, but with this, with the big organization that Polish Women's Strike is, we I gave them the words that we won't cover for them. So we will not, not, not say what cover for them. That we will not become a major organization um, doing the pro refugee work because it would be stealing their work and their ideas and their experience and their everything else. And we know how media work. Uh, so we have to be very careful as this big organization uh, not to just appropriate um, the, the fact that there are pro-refugee organizations. So we kind of really concentrate on pushing the interest towards them because we are asked about the pro-refugee actions, we are asked about coordination, we are asked uh, about many things. So it's a very, very hard task and a very big challenge to push people to communicate with them to see that there are pro-refugee organizations um, because we cannot just stomp on somebody else's work and somebody else's field of work uh, because it's just easier for the media. It's, we cannot do that. And we are a big organization, so many organizations that work in similar fields to ours can be actually now scared that they will be just, they will just disappear um, from the general perception the moment we step in. So our logo, and I'm telling you what we are doing, but if you see, when you look for that, you won't see our logo nowhere. Most of the things we do, we're not doing officially there because this is the time to build the capacity of the pro-refugee organizations and we, as we've built ours in the last year. But there cannot be just this big heavy organization uh, just next to them getting all the attention. So we have to use this experience that we had Collecting, we collected a million and a half Polish Zlotys um, uh, during two months last year. And this is the aim also for them. And, and it's absolutely possible that it will happen, that they will go the same way, that they will be five times bigger, uh, they will have 50 times more money, and so on, so on. This is the moment now with this horrible crisis for those organizations to grow, to get more professional, to get volunteers, and to get more people, and to educate people also. Uh, but we have to be very careful not to just step over them and to just push them away because this is something that is always a threat when you run a big organization that is recognized. This is something that we really have to be careful with. Each time when I appear some, somewhere, I have to be careful, for example, not to be photographed there. There's a whole media story then about me doing something. And it's not me. I'm just visiting people that do. So I, I especially avoid some of the situations, uh, not to take the focus from people who are doing the actual work. This is the help desk thing also that we help many organizations um, with donations and coordination, some other things, but we don't communicate that. This is the non-corporal style. Uh, we don't do the photos uh, from the meetings. Oh, we met uh, to discuss how we will help this and that. No, we never do that. We don't do that. We have other things to show. No. Yeah, so that's that. And I think the Polish-Belarusian border situation will get worse and nobody was prepared for that. And we will have it covered because with this government, uh, we basically learned to build systems next to the systems. We built the system to provide abortions, we build the healthcare system, we build the education system, we, we, we build the persons with disabilities help system. And now we, we are building the, the pro-refugee system next to the state that doesn't provide any services to anyone any, anymore. So this is the next task. And it's very hard, but I'm sure that we will manage. Thank you, Marta. And the last question for this part uh, is for Lesia. Lesia, what do you think is the future for Save Quito Ukraine campaign is going to be? Um, okay. Um, 
Something that I actually forgot to, to uh, speak about is uh, our goals in uh, Save Quito Ukraine campaign. Like what it used to be and what it is right now is pretty much the same is uh, not only saving the building, but make it live, revitalizing it and finding the function, uh, a commercial function that would work for the owner and for the city as well. Uh, these goals, um, these goals means that we actually have just two ways of working on this process right now. First of them uh, is um, a dialogue with the owner, uh, which probably will take a lot of time because right now he just doesn't want to accept the situation that his, his construction is freezed. Uh, so it will take years. Uh, the second thing is working with the government and uh, city administration, like in order to legally make the owner of the building revitalize it in the previous form. Uh, both of the variants are actually super long term strategies, and it's not something that's going to happen like tomorrow. Uh, and considering this fact, uh, we understand that we're going to hold attention uh, for a long time, which makes us uh, also consider um, consider uh, various options. For example, as I said, coordinating with uh, other initiatives uh, throughout uh, Kyiv and Ukraine, because first of all, sharing experience is something that has never um, happened enough uh, before in Ukraine. Uh, actually, Kvito Ukraine was the uh, the place where we met, uh, like the initiatives that were fighting for the buildings ten years ago, and they shared their experience just now with us. Uh, so we are thinking of like moving forward uh, to something like a forum organization, a book, a something, something that would work as a manual for uh, protecting cultural and architectural heritage. Um, and yeah, working on things like uh, March for Kiev, something that would make us talk to the government freely and um, on the same level. And then uh, the other thing that we're considering, considering is uh, uh, in the future is uh, creating new messages so that we hold the interests of uh, white public with us. Because, frankly speaking, architecture or like modernism or um, heritage isn't something that people usually relate to in their everyday life. Like it's not something that touches everybody, even in Kyiv or in this neighborhood. So we have to think of uh, putting what, what, like putting our interests uh, in a part of a wider narrative that everybody can relate to. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Kvito Ukraine as a part of architecture and heritage, but at the same time, we're talking about the right of uh, people to choose what city they're living, for example. And uh, right now we're working on messages like this uh, that will actually define how we will be working in the next uh, few years. But anyway, the future of Kvito Ukraine, until we're working on it, <laughs> um, it's like at least a couple of years of fighting for preserving the building and making it alive again. Thank you, Asya. And thank you for this presentations. Now we are slowly moving towards the break on the second part of our masterclass. And before we are going for the break, I would uh, ask you, all of you to choose the group in which you will be working through this second part of uh, 